Hello, and welcome to Vanguard Audiobooks. My name is Alex Linder, and you can find this and everything that we discuss at vnnforum.com. Today we're going to pick up with part three of Yaki's masterwork, Imperium. And it begins, Cultural Vitalism, A Culture Health. Cultural Vitalism, page 245 for I recognize only two nations, the Occident and the Orient, Napoleon. Then the second epigraph is from uh, Spengler. It is want of race and nothing else that makes intellectuals, philosophers, doctrinaires, utopists, incapable of understanding the depths of this metaphysical hatred, which is the beat difference of two current, two currents of being manifested as an unbearable dissonance, a hatred that may become tragic for both. So it is one of race that makes philosophers incapable of understanding the depth of this metaphysical hatred, <clears throat> which may become tragic for both. And a third epigraph, again from Napoleon, like the first, I wanted to prepare the fusion of the great interest of Europe as I had accomplished that of the parties. I concerned myself little with the passing rancor of the peoples, for I was sure that the results would lead them irresistibly back to me. Europe would in this way have become, in truth, a united nation, and everyone would have been, no matter where he traveled, in the same fatherland. This fusion will accomplish itself sooner or later through the pressure of the facts. The impulse has been given which, since my downfall and the disappearance of my system, will make the restoration of balance possible in Europe only by merger and fusion of the great nations. Again, Napoleon saying that. Introduction to the chapter. Introduction is a separate title, or we'll call it a chapter here. For the first time is developed here the thesis of cultural vitalism, the physiognomy of the adaptation, health, or illness of a high culture. I suppose this is where he thinks he's being different from Spengler. Heretofore, a culture has usually been looked upon as a result, a mere sum total of collective activity of human beings and groups of human beings. To the extent that its unity and continuity was perceived at all, this was regarded as purely material-linked influence of individuals, groups, or written ideas on contemporaries or posterity. But with the advance of age of the Western culture, its unity began dimly to be perceived. This unity was formulated in very different ways, with different points of origin, different laws of development, but the essential idea was the unity of culture, <coughs> or unity of the culture. Even in the home of materialism, Benjamin Kidd recognized the inner unity of the West in his work Western Civilization. Nietzsche, Lamprecht, Breisig, Murray are only a few of those who sensed this idea. In an age which starts from facts and not from programs, which submits to realities without trying to make them pass a rationalistic test, it has become self-evident, spiritually compulsory, to think within this new framework. If two individuals, widely separated geographically, and in no contact with one another, developed similar inventions, similar philosophies, chose the same subject matter for drama or lyric, this is not influence nor coincidence, but a reflection of the development of the culture, capital C, to which both belong. From the higher cultural standpoint, the arguments about who was the first to invent this or that device, who originated this or that idea, are quite barren. These questions are not on any higher plane than the legal, at best. If the development in question is one of superpersonal force, and not a mere personal amusement, it is the development of the culture, and the fact that it was expressed simultaneously by more than one person only testifies to its destiny, capital D, quality. The nature of the unity of the culture is purely spiritual in its origin. The material unity that follows is the unfolding of the precedent, inner spiritual unity. Life is the actualizing of the possible. The development of a high culture is the unfolding over the predetermined organic lifespan of the inner possibilities contained in the culture soul. 
The one in which we live is the eighth high culture to appear on this planet. The unity and interrelationship of the totality of forms and creations of any one of the others is apparent to us because we stand completely outside it and cannot enter into the nuances of its soul since we belong to another. This impenetrability of an alien culture is part of a wider organic generalization. Even the spirit of another age of our own culture, of another nation, another individual, in the last analysis presents difficulties to complete understanding. The technique of comprehension of other life forms is living into them, living into italicized. To measure time and calculate the behavior of another organism is valueless to organic assimilation. Materialistic psychology, with its heaps of results on paper, never aided one individual to understand another. If any identity was reached, it was in spite of the abstract equipment difficulty in assimilating oneself into other organic forms, understanding them, penetrating them, is a matter of degree. A person with similar character is readily understood by us. If his character is dissimilar, but his background is similar, he can be understood with more difficulty. Different nationality, race, different cultural origin raise successively steeper barriers to mutuality. This sets out one of the problems of cultural vitalism. CV capitalized, needless to say. The question is, to what extent can a culture impress new populations entering its area with a cultural idea, i.e. magic dirt here? Is it possible to any degree? Subsidiary problems arise from the fact that such new populations may have one or all of various kinds of cohesiveness, that of a people or of a race or of a nation or of a state or of another culture. The further problem arises of the precise relation of the culture to the population in its service and to those outside its area. It is formulated in this way because high cultures are bound to a landscape and the formative impulses always appear in the original landscape, even in the last phase, that of civilization, in which the culture externalizes itself completely and expands to its furthest limits. The expansive externalizing tendency begins already in the middle of it, the lifespan, but it only becomes dominant with the sharp seizure, or seizure marked by the crisis of civilization. For us, the symbol of this break is Napoleon. Since his time, the populations of the earth, the entire earth, have been brought within the arc of the most unlimited imperialism known to history. They stand, however, in varying relationships to the mother idea of this imperialism, and these relationships must also be examined. Next chapter is the articulation of a culture. The nation's thought forms, art forms, and ideas which are the expression of the development of a culture are always in the custody of a comparatively small group. How large this group is, how easily it can replenish itself, depends on the character of the culture. In this respect, the classical culture is instructive. Its ideas were one and all exoteric, Socrates conducts his philosophizing in the Agora. In our case, the picture of Leibniz or Descartes carrying on such activity would be ludicrous in the extreme, for Western philosophy is the possession of very few. But any culture, even the exoteric classical, is restricted for its full expression in whatever direction to certain levels of the population in its area. Culture is, by its very nature, selective, exclusive, the use of the word in the personal sense, a cultured man, describes a man out of the ordinary, a man whose ideas and attitudes are ordered and articulated. Cultured in the personal sense means devoted to something beyond oneself and one's own domestic well-being. In the 19th century world picture, with its atomistic mania, only individuals existed, nothing higher. Therefore, the word was used to describe a practitioner or appreciator of art or literature. But patriotism, devotion to duty, ethical imperative, heroism, self-sacrifice are also an expression of culture. Primitive man does not evince them. A war is just as much an expression of culture as a poem. A factory is a cathedral. A rifle as a statue. A high culture in the course of its fulfillment 
acts in all directions of thought and action, and on every person within its area. The intensity of its action in a given direction depends on the culture soul hyphenated. Some of the cultures have been passionately historical, like the Chinese, some completely ahistoric, like the Indian. Some have developed massive techniques, like the Egyptian and our own. Some have ignored techniques, like the classical and the Mexican. The intensity of the impression of the culture on individuals is proportional to their rep receptivity to spiritual impressions. The individual of small soul and limited horizon lives for himself because he understands nothing else. To such a man, Western music is merely an alternate, up and down, loud and soft. Philosophy is mere words. History is a collection of fairy tales, even the reality of which is not inwardly felt. Politics is the selfishness of the great. Military conscription a burden which his lack of moral courage forces him to accept. Thus even his individualism is a mere denial of anything higher and not an affirming of his own soul. The extraordinary man is the one who puts something else before his own life and security. Even as he faced the firing squad, William Walker could have saved his life by merely renouncing his claim to president of Nicaragua. To the common man, this is insane. The common man is unjust, but not on principle. He is selfish, but is incapable of the imperative of Ibsen's exalted selfishness. He is the slave of his passions, but incapable of higher sexual love, for even this is an expression of culture. Primitive man simply would not understand Western erotic if it were not explained to him, this sublimation of passion into metaphysics. He lacks any sort of honor and will submit to any humiliation rather than revolt. It is always leader natures who revolt. He gambles in hope of winning, and if he loses, he whimpers. He would rather live on his knees than die on his feet. He accepts the loudest voice as the true one. He follows the leader of the moment, but only so far, and when the leader is eclipsed by a new one, he points out his record of opposition. In victory he is a bully, in defeat he is a lackey. His talk is big, his deeds small. He likes to play, but has no sportsmanship. Great thoughts and plans he castigates as megalomania. Anyone who tries to pull him up and along the road of higher accomplishment he hates, and when the chance offers he crucifies him, like Christ, burns him like Savonarola, kicks his dead body in the square in Milan. That would be uh, Mussolini. He is always laughing at the discomfiture of another, but he has no sense of humor and is equally incapable of true seriousness. He denounces the crime of passion, but eagerly reads the literature of such crimes. He herds in the streets to see an accident and enjoys seeing another sustain the blows of fate. He does not care if his countrymen are spilling their blood as long as he is secure. He is everything mean and unheroic, but he lacks the mentality to be a Iago or Richard III. And again, what Wamba said, he, people are too weak to be evil. They're just scrotes, and he's saying kind of the same thing there. He has no access to culture, and when he dares, he persecutes anyone who has. Nothing delights him more than to see a great leader fall. He hated Metternich and Wellington, the symbols of tradition. He refused, as Reichstag, to send ex-Chancellor Bismarck a birthday greeting. He makes up the constituency of all parliaments everywhere, and he invades all councils of war to advise prudence and caution. If beliefs to which he was committed become dangerous, he recants. They were never his anyway. He is the inner weakness of every organism, the enemy of all greatness, the material of treason. It is not such human stuff that an exacting high culture can use to further its destiny. The common man is the material with which the great political leaders in democratic conditions work. In earlier centuries, the com common man did not attend the cultural drama. It did not interest him, and the participants were not yet under the rationalistic spell. The counting mania, as Nietzsche called it. When democratic conditions proceed to their extreme, the result is that even the leaders are common men, with the jealous and crooked soul of envy of that to which they are not equal, like Roosevelt and his coterie in America. In his cult of the common man, he was de deifying himself like Caligula. The abolition of quality smothers the exceptional man in his youth and turns him into a cynic. 
In earlier centuries, there was no suggestion anywhere that the masses of the population had a part to play. When this idea does triumph, it turns out that the only role these masses can play is the passive one of unwieldy building material for the articulate part of the population. What is the physical articulation of the body of the culture? The more exacting the nature of the cultural task, the higher the type of humanity required for its performance. There is in all cultures a spiritual level of the entire population called the culture-bearing stratum. It is this articulation of culture populations alone which makes the expression of a high culture possible. It is the technic of living, the habitus of the culture. The culture-bearing stratum is the custodian of the wealth of expression forms of the culture. To it belong all the creators in the domains of religion, philosophy, science, music, literature, the arts of form, mathematics, politics, technics, and war, as well as the non-creators who fully understand, and themselves experience, the developments in this higher world, the appreciators. So, within itself, the culture-bearing stratum is articulated into creators and appreciators. It is, in general, the latter who transmit the great creations downward, insofar as this is possible. This process serves to recruit the higher material, wherever it appears, into the culture-bearing stratum. The process of replenishment is continually going on, for the culture-bearing stratum is not hereditary in any strict sense. The culture-bearing stratum is a purely spiritual level of the populace of the culture. It has no economic, political, social, or other hallmark. Some of its most luminous creators have lived and died in want, e.g. Beethoven and Schubert. Other souls, equally creative but less rugged, have been strangled by poverty, Chatterton. Many of its creative members go through their lives entirely unnoticed. Mendel, Kierkegaard, Copernicus. Others are mistaken for mere talents, Shakespeare and Rembrandt. The culture-bearing stratum is not recognized by its contemporaries in any way as a unity, nor does it recognize itself as one. As a stratum, it is invisible, like the culture it carries, because it is a purely psychic stratum. It can be given no material description to satisfy the intellectuals. Even the intellectuals would admit, however, that Europe or America could be thrown into material chaos from which it would take years to emerge if the few thousands in the higher technical ranks were removed. Think of Katyn Forest, where the Jews tried to decapitate Poland and kill all the leading stratum. And he's saying, even if you only killed some of the top technicians, at least the intellectuals would recognize that that would, would kill the cultural stratum. But he's saying that the cultural stratum is psychic. It's not something that can be so easily measured. These technicians are a part of the culture-bearing stratum, although it is not merely occupational. Technicians, of course, like economic leaders or military leaders, play purely subordinate roles in the culture drama. The most important part of this stratum at any one time is the group which is the custodian of the highest idea. Thus, in Dante's time, emperor and pope were the two highest symbols of reality, and it was in the service of either one of these symbols that the leading members of the culture-bearing stratum were then, then to be found. The highest symbolic force was then transferred to the dynasties, and dynastic politics claimed its lives during the, its centuries. With the coming of the Enlightenment and rationalism, the whole West goes into a crisis of long duration, and not less does the culture-bearing stratum. It was split even more than usual, and only now, after two centuries, is it possible to restore its basic unity. I say more than usual, for it must not be supposed that the culture-bearing stratum ever was a sort of international, of Freemasonry. On the contrary, it supplied leaders on both sides of every war and every tendency. That's the end of section one of the third uh, part. Section two. Within this stratum, there is constant struggle between tradition and innovation. The strong, vital part naturally represents the new, forward development affirming the next age. It is a function of tradition to assure continuity. Tradition is the memory of a superpersonal soul. It must see that the same creative spirit of the grand past is present at each innovation. The crisis of rationalism places the same frightful strain on the higher stratum that it does on the entire organism. 
The step forward, democracy, is affirmative in the last analysis because it is an historical necessity in the life of a culture as we know from history. But it is a difficult step for men to take who have given their lives to construction and creation for to mobilize the masses is to destroy. The step from culture to civilization is a fall. It is the onset of senility, moving from the inward to the outward, from the spiritual, philosophical, artistic, to the economic, rational, political, materialistic. For this reason, leaders whose center of gravity was on the side of culture resisted the revolution of democracy with all their power. Burke, Goethe, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Metternich, Wellington, Carlyle, Nietzsche, the culture-bearing stratum articulated into creators and appreciators, is no or is invisible as such. It corresponds to no economic class, no social class, no nobility, no aristocracy, no occupation. Its members are not all public figures by any means, but by its existence, this stratum actualizes a high culture on this earth. If a process had existed by which members of the stratum could be all selected, the extra-European forces would probably have exterminated it in the attempt to destroy the West. Again, Katyn Forest. The attempt would not have succeeded, for this stratum is produced by the culture, and after a long period of chaos, a generation or two, depending on circumstances, this cultural organ would have been present again, including in its numbers descendants of the invaders who would also succumb to the idea. The possibilities in this direction will be more thoroughly examined later. In a political age, it is natural that the best brains go into politics and war. Those who are equal to renunciation and sacrifice are the heroes of this realm. War politics is preeminently the field of heroism, and the sacrifices in this realm are never in vain from the cultural standpoint, for the war itself is an expression of culture. Considered from the rationalistic standpoint, it is stupid to devote one's life to an idea, any idea whatever. But once again, life, with its organic reality, does not obey rationalism with its urge to mediocrity. Thus the best are culled from every generation and impelled into the service of the culture. The noblest of all are the heroes who die for an idea, but everyone cannot be a hero, and the others live for an idea. An invariable characteristic of this level is its spiritual sensitivity, which brings it more impressions than the others receive. This is coupled with more complex internal possibilities, which order the volume of impressions. It can feel the new spirit of the age before it is articulate, before it triumphs. This also describes all great men, and one reason so many perish violently is that they promulgated things which were, quote, ahead of their time, unquote. These men lived in a world more real than that of the realistic people, and these same realists are outraged and burn the Savonarola, whom they would follow unquestioningly a generation or two later. This vital plane is only a psychic cultural unity during the long centuries of the culture, but with the coming of the late civilization, mid-20th century, the dominant idea of the entire culture is political. Napoleon's politics is destiny is even more true now than when he said it. The two ideas of democracy and authority stand opposed, and only one of them belongs to the future. Only authority represents a step forward, and thus the strongest, most vital, creative elements in the culture-bearing stratum are found in the service of the resurgence of authority. It has become political-cultural. Since the culture-bearing stratum has its highest importance in an age like the present one, when quality reasserts itself against quantity, it must be defined now as precisely as possible. The notion of mere prominence must be disassociated strongly from the idea of belonging to the stratus, stratum. Wagner, Ibsen, Cromwell, none of whom were prominent until middle life, were nonetheless in this plane of life and thought in their previous years. The notion of prominence is related to the idea of the culture-bearing stratum in this way. Every man who is prominent in any field, and who, has, who also has inner gifts of vision, appreciation, or creativeness, naturally belongs to this stratum. Prominence, however, may be the result of accident, of birth, or fortune, 
and Europeans have seen two periods in recent history after the first two world wars, when nearly all the ruling politicians in Europe were simply common men thrown up by chance and the distorted life of the higher organism. The culture-bearing stratum has its highest importance now, rather than in previous centuries, because it is a relatively tinier minority. The vast increase of numbers in Europe, it tripled the population in the 19th century, did not increase the numbers of this stratum, nor of higher natures generally. This stratum was as numerous in the time of the Crusades as it is now. It is simply the way of culture to choose minorities for its expression. Multiplication of population is downwards. The tension between quantity and quality grows greater with the increase of numbers, and the culture-bearing stratum acquires a mathematically higher significance. The tension can be suggested in figures. There are not more than 250,000 souls in Europe who constitute, by their potentialities, their imperative, their gifts, their existence, the culture-bearing stratum of the West. Their geographical distribution has never been entirely uniform. And here he's almost echoing Charles Murray's uh, uh, Human Accomplishment book, if you want to read about where actual creations come from. Their geographical distribution has never been entirely uniform. In that nation which the culture chose for the expression of the spirit of the age, as it chose Spain for the expression of ultramontanism, in the 16th and 17th centuries, France for the Rococo in the 18th century, or England for capitalism in the 19th, there was always a higher proportion of the culturally significant than in countries which were not playing the leading cultural role. This fact was known to the extra-European forces in their attempt to destroy the Western civilization after the Second World War, and was utilized as far as it could be within the limits of expediency. The real purpose behind the mass hangings mass looting and mass starvation was to destroy the few by destroying the many. The articulation of the culture has three aspects. The idea itself, the transmitting stratum, those to whom it is transmitted. The latter comprise the vast numbers of human beings who possess any refinement whatever, who maintain a certain standard of honor or morality, who take care of their property, who have self-respect and respect the rights of others, who aspire to improve themselves in their situation instead of pulling down those who have enriched their inner life and raised themselves in the world. They are the body of the culture vis-a-vis -vis the culture-bearing stratum as its brain and the idea as its soul. In each person who belongs to this numerically large group, there is a quantum of ambition and appreciation toward the creations of culture. They furnish the instruments by which the creators can carry out their own work. By this means they give significance to their own lives, a significance which the underworld would not understand. The role of a Messinus is not the highest, but it is of cultural value. Who knows whether we would have read Wagner's greatest works but for Ludwig II. When we read the results of a great battle, do we always realize that it was not simply a chess game between two captains, but that hundreds of firm officers and thousands of obedient men died to write this line in history? to make this day and date forever remembered? And when a threatened sack of society is put down by the police and army, the casualties on the side of order thus give by their deaths a higher significance to their lives also. Not everyone can play a great role, but the right to give meaning to his life cannot be taken from a man. But beneath all this, is the stratum totally incapable of cultural attainment, even the most modest. The mob, canai, dog pack, purbel, underworld, profanum vulgus, the common man of the American cult. These preside at every terror, listen wistfully or wishfully to every Bolshevik agitator, secrete venom at the sight of any manifestation of culture or superiority. This stratum exists at all stages of every culture, as the Peasants' Wars, the Jacquerie, Watt Tyler, Jack Cade, John Ball, Thomas Münzer, the Jacobins, the Communards, the Spanish Militiamen, the Mob in the Square in Milan, killed Mussolini, or were toying with him after death, are there to show. As soon as a creative man 
makes his resolve and proceeds with his work, somewhere else in the dark envious soul there rises a crooked determination to stop him, to smash the work. In his later years, the nihilist Tolstoy gave perfect expression to this basic fact with his formula that not every, even one stone should be on top of another. The slogan of the Bolshevik in 1918 was also illuminating. Destroy everything. In our age, this underworld is in the possession of the class warriors, the rear guard of rationalism. It is thus working from the larger political viewpoint solely for the extra-European forces. Previous rebellions of this stratum were all doomed because of the lack of unity of the culture, the pristine vigor of the creative impulses, and the lack of external danger of such crushing proportions as exists in this age. Its history is not yet over with. Asia has use for this stratum and plans for it. Next chapter, Tradition and Genius. But he's saying about culture that it's, it's, this, it's a psychic thing. It's the possession of a few. And then there's a larger outer circle of people who appreciate culture. So there's a culture bearing, the culture appreciators, and then and those two are maybe together are culture bearing. But the culture bearing is a small psychic minority, truly. Then the appreciators, and then the rest are kind of the mob or the underworld, the draggers down. Next chapter, tradition and genius. There are two different ways in which the culture bearing stratum can perform its function. The first is through the presence of a high tradition of accomplishment along a given line, a school. The second is through the instrumentality of occasional genius. They can combine, in fact they are never completely separated, for individual genius is always present at the formation of a tradition in the first instance, and the presence of the tradition is not hostile to genius when it does appear. Nevertheless, they are different methods of culture expression, and both have importance to the 20th century world outlook which is here formulated in its essentials. Italian painting from 1250 to 1550 is an example of a tradition at work. The Flemish Dutch school of the 17th century is another. It was not necessary for a painter in one of those schools to be a great master in order to express himself fully. The form was there, unquestioned, it was only required to master it and to contribute one's personal development of its possibilities. Spanish and German painting, on the other hand, represent a collection of great originals and not the sure forward progress of a tradition. The sublimest of all was the Gothic architecture to around 1400. So powerful was the tradition that the idea of a work of art, which presupposes a personality creating it, did not even exist. But traditions like this are not confined to arts. Scholastic philosophy represented the same super-personal unity working itself out through many personalities, all in the service and development of a tradition. From Rosellinus and Anselm through Thomas Aquinas to Gabriel Beale, the problems and their complete exploitation are continuous. Each thinker, regardless of his gifts, whether a man of genius or merely a hard worker, was trained by his predecessors and himself developed into his successors, it was not the solutions and not even always the questions which were continuous. It was the method and thoroughness of the investigation and formulation which showed the presence of the tradition. From Cromwell to Joseph Chamberlain, the beginning and the end of that high political tradition which built the great British Empire, which at its highest point exerted its control over 17 twentieths of the surface of the earth, England was the example of the possibility of tradition in politics as well as in philosophy, music, and the arts of form. How many men of political genius appeared in the premiership during these centuries? Only the two pits. Nevertheless, England emerged from all the general wars of those centuries with increased power. Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. Spanish Succession War, 1702 to 1713. Austrian Succession Wars, 1741 to 1763. Napoleonic Wars, 1800 to 1815. Wars of German Unification, 1863 to 1871. Only one serious blunder was made during these centuries, the loss of America, 1775 to 1783. The essence of this tradition was nothing other than applying only political thinking to politics. 
Cromwell, the theologian, departed from this only occasionally, and more in words and expressions of sympathy than in actions. His successors in the tradition of empire building were not burdened with his heavy theological equipment, which they transformed into cant, a word translatable into no other European language. The technique of cant was what enabled English diplomacy to score continued successes in the world of facts, i.e. the world of violence, of cunning, of sin, while maintaining before itself the attitude of selfless morality. To enrich the country by new possession was thus bringing civilization to, quote, backward races, and so on through the whole gamut of political tactics. Traditions show in this example one of their prime characteristics— they are not efficacious unless profoundly mastered by the individuals. Yeah, and tradition or traditionalism tends to be a word marketed by certain tendencies, in my view. Thus, other European statesmen during the 19th century, the century of the Anglicization of Europe, attempted to utilize Kant and merely made themselves ridiculous. Wilson, the American world-saver who modestly offered himself as president of the world as morality, of the world as morality, went too far. A sure tact was the prerequisite of successful employment of Kant, and this required for its mastery growing up in a Kant-saturated atmosphere. In the same way, the Austrian officer corps, whose ethical qualities Napoleon missed in his own officers, presupposed a lifelong preparation and training in a certain atmosphere, and not three months military training on the basis of an intelligence test. The great thing about a tradition is that the leader of the moment is not alone. The qualities he lacks, and which the situation may need, are sure to be present somewhere in the entourage. The presence of a political tradition makes it extremely unlikely in the first place that an incompetent will be placed in a position of high political authority, and if it does happen that a weak personality arrives on the heights by chance, tradition again makes his early departure certain. It might be supposed that this is contradicted by the case of Lord North, but the initial blunders of his American policy were only seen as such in retrospect. If he could have followed them up with further strict measures, America would not have been lost, but his domestic situation vis-a-vis -vis the Whigs on the one hand and the monarch on the other was difficult in the extreme, and his policy was hamstrung by the same type of rationalist elements who were preaching contracts social and rights of man on the continent. On the contrary, the successful avoidance of revolution and terror from the Wilkes affair in mid-18th century through the horrors of 93, the general revolutionary waves of 1830 and 1848, was attributable to the presence of an unimpaired tradition. Tradition is not a rigid thing, a guarantee of certain results, not at all, for in history it is the unexpected which happens. The imponderables make their appearance. Incident plays counterpoint to destiny. A slight gap may appear also in a tradition, but the health of the tradition-bearing stratum shows itself by quickly closing the opening. A tradition of statesmanship is some a sort of platonic idea of excellence which molds men, as far as possible, in each case, and serves as a form for their personal expression. The results are shown by a high average of training and ability. Fortunate is the political organism with such leadership. What is missed in one place is picked up in another. Individual quirks are not allowed to become political dogmas. The last result of the presence of a tradition in a political unit is that destiny is kept on a sure path and incident is minimized. End of that chapter, and the next one is called Genius. The name Genius, describing a certain small stratum of humanity, came into the effective vocabulary of the Western culture only with the advent of humanism. The 20th century means by this word what Emerson meant by, quote, representative man, or Carlyle by hero. The comprehensive delineation of the subject of genius by Lange Eichbaum, the distinguished European scholar, has given the word its content for this age. 
We no longer see genius under an aspect of causality or predestination. This was the only way materialism could understand the word. Nietzsche pierced through this predestination idea of genius with his aphorism. The higher the type a man represents, the greater is the improbability that he will succeed because of the increased diversity and difficulty of his life conditions. The word genius, thus, has acquired through the centuries a large objective content and has come self-evidently to contain within it the idea of fame. If the word were to be used purely subjectively, it would describe simply a man with great creative force. There are always some of these men at work, but their creative efforts may be in any of the various directions of culture. The test of creative force has come to be success, namely the personal success of the man in translating his personal potentialities into creation, whether of thought or deed. Not absolute success is meant, for this would exclude nearly all men. Neither Wallenstein, Cromwell, Napoleon, or the hero that we have seen attained absolute success. The success of each was, however, personal, in the sense that posterity can read his name in the skies at night. It is the spirit of the age which influences greatly the direction of the crea creative ability of men of genius. Thus, in the Gothic religious time, many men of genius became religionists, philosophers, saints, and martyrs. In the Enlightenment, men of genius appeared as artists and universal men. In the time of civilization, men of genius appear mostly in the externalized pursuits of technics, economics, politics, and war. All tendencies exist in all ages, but in each age, one idea is uppermost. High politics is appropriate in every age, and in the coming age, it is the leading idea. In our times, and the next times, the men of creative force will be found largely concentrated in the service of the resurgence of authority. The crass stupidity of rationalism and materialism was nowhere more perfectly in evidence than in its attempt to make the word genius into an intelligence term. Naive tests were even devised to detect the presence of genius, which could be shown by a number. In the age of materialism, there was no scruple about weighing and numbering the faculties of the soul. The fact is that intelligence is the functional opposite of genius. Intelligence is dissection. Genius is creation. One is analysis. The other is synthesis. The first is directed toward the part the second toward the whole. They are as related as terrestrial and astral, counting and imagining. It must be said that while genius is great creative force, each man has some creative force, enough to make of his own life such a work that those who come after him need never be ashamed of him. The interest of the 20th century is in politics, hence the best significance of genius in this sphere will be examined here. It is best understood by comparison with tradition and politics. Tradition secures the steady fulfillment of the idea by training up the available talent to a high average level. It is superior to genius as a vehicle for the actualization of an idea, for the lifespan of the tradition is also the lifespan of the idea, while genius is only allotted the usual three score and ten. The passing of genius leaves a gap but the tradition only passes with the fulfillment of the idea itself. In the larger sense, Cromwell is the beginning of the English national political tradition, yet in a narrower personal sense he did not found a tradition, for after his death it was but a matter of months before the dynasty was back, and Cromwell's body was exhumed and dragged through the streets of London by wild horses. But when once the English political tradition was founded in the Cromwellian spirit, it lasted right through to Joseph Chamberlain. What is genius in politics? How does it manifest itself in this realm? In one thing simply, it represents the idea of the future. If one were to state the relation to the present of the masses, a tradition, and genius, he would say that the masses are all, always behind the present. The tr the tradition is alert at each moment, adjusting to the future, but the genius represents the Promethean thrusting into the future with unleashed force. Genius is dependent for its actualization on the appreciation of the culture-bearing stratum or nation-bearing stratum. Talent can understand anything that genius can imagine or create once it is actualized, but genius always impresses at first as fantastic. 
Alexander the Great, Frederick the Great, Cromwell, Napoleon, the hero of this age, all impressed most people at the beginning of their careers as being unworldly, out of touch with reality. There was some justification for this, for they were in touch with a new world, the next reality. In this connection, the use of the word present is only a figure of speech. Actually, there is no present in the world of politics. The present is simply the point of tension between past and future. Genius in politics belongs always on the side of the future. Genius is a great creative force in the realm of action. Creation is of deeds. Deeds are the form of the actualization of the future. At the very beginning of the civilization period of the Western culture, two extraordinary men stand opposed, Napoleon and Metternich. Only the empire builder has genius. His opponent, though equal in political skill, in assessment of the realities of the time and in force of character, was a mere conserver, a servant of the past. The realities he cognized were those of the immediately previous reality, not those of the coming reality. It is genius of Napoleon's kind that occasionally appears and delivers the new spirit of the age, the new reality. Tail Talent of Metternich's kind lacks the vision of the genius, and it is solely accidental whether or not he opposes him. If Metternich had been a Frenchman, he would have been a minister of Napoleon. What precisely are the qualities of genius in politics which constitute its maestria and its inner imperative? First, vision. It sees the possibilities of the future, and its mind is thereby freed from the trammels which hinder the average man in his thinking. To the prosaic mind, everything which is represents the end of all development. The future is to be a mere extension of the past. Second, spiritual purity. The ordinary man is an eclectic. He carries in his head hundreds of contradictory ideas and beliefs. Not so the creative man in politics. He thinks along one line and one line only. This gives to his enemies the opportunity of convincing many that he is mentally ill, and they have never failed to do so, from Alexander to the hero we have seen. But political genius and its enemies pass into two different categories of history. His name is written in bronze letters as the symbol, meaning apotheosis, an incarnation of the spirit of his age. His enemies turn out on this high plane to have been merely the material with which he hewed his deeds. Third, intensity. The voice of genius commands. It is harsh, intolerant. It demands and impels upward. Genius is inseparable from the presence of a rushing inner chaos, the prerequisite of a formative work. Under a Frederick or a Charles the Twelfth, men will overcome tactical odds of five to one, strategical odds of thirty to one, but not under Loudon or Archduke Charles or a Grant. These latter need crushing superiority to make up for their inner lack. Fourth, the sense of a mission. This vision, purity, and intensity are all brought into an ethical focus. The things which he sees are stamped with necessity. He must actualize them. This accounts for the powerfully dramatic influence of a political genius upon the facts of history. His forceful mission compels everyone to orient himself to it. Everyone is either with him or against him. He becomes the center of the world. Lastly, an imponderable. Genius is life at its highest human potential, and all life is uncanny, irrational, mysterious. There is something about genius that makes men rise spiritually. It is the something that gave Napoleon victory on almost every field. That sat like an eagle on the shoulder of Moltke as he worked quietly at his task of shaping the form of the 20th and 21st centuries. It may be merely the personality accompanying these extraordinary gifts. It may be a transcendental emanation from the higher organism. It is unknowable, but it, it is there. Next, genius in the age of absolute politics. There could be no question that a tradition which makes use of the ever-present talent of the successive generations is superior to a genius for the purpose of actualizing an idea in its perfection. But the idea will be actualized without either of them, their presence, together or separate, affects only the rhythmic sureness and external purity of the life process. The soul of each culture is an organism, and therefore possesses the mark of individuality. This is stamped on everything connected with the culture, including its history style, 
just as persons differ in their way of expressing themselves, one man forceful and imperious, another quiet but equally effective, so do high cultures. The classical offers a strong contrast to our own in this. Its historical style, in comparison with ours, is one of incident. Accents are not sharp, transitions are not conscious or marked by the intensely formed turning points of the Western history. While their men of genius were not fewer, genius played a smaller role in the working out. Genius was the focus of less force. Western nations have also seen great developments which were unaccompanied by the phenomenon of direction of the whole idea onto one man. For instance, the German Wars of Liberation, 1813 to 1815, England's transition to, to democracy, 1715 to 1800. But in the middle of the 20th century, we see about us the wreckage of two centuries of rationalism. The high old traditions of the West have been mostly destroyed. The horizontal war of the banker and the class warrior against the Western civilization have laid the old quality low. But history has not stopped and the greatest imperative of all in the political sphere is now operative. A new quality tradition is arising. As the philosopher of this age has said, there are no longer in the world any sacred forms of political existence whose very age is an unassailable power. Since an effective tradition is absent in the political realm of the Western civilization, we may expect that the Western demand for sharp accents in history will repose gigantic forces in the hands of individual men, the hero whom we have seen was a symbol of the future. History does not stop. No one man is more important than history. The relationship of political genius to the mass was misread by 19th century materialism and also by Nietzsche. Materialism regarded the great politician as bound to work for the, of course, material improvement of the mass. Nietzsche regarded the masses as existing only to produce the great men. But the idea of purpose cannot describe the process as it is. Apart from all ideology, the great man and the masses are unity. Both are in the service of the idea, and each finds his historical significance only with regard to the counterpole. Carlyle voiced the instinctive demand of this age when the idea of authority and monarchy has once again a good conscience. Find the ablest man and let him be king. Democratic ideologists, with their heads buried deep in the sand, say that maybe a bad monarch will appear. But the imperative of history is not to produce a perfect system, but to fulfill the historical mission. It was this that produced democracy, and it is this that now pays no attention to the whining of the past, but only to be the rumble of the future. Good or bad, the monarchs are coming. On the front of the tottering edifice is printed in gaudy letters, Democracy. But behind it is seen to be a cash till, and the banker sits, running his hands through the money that was the blood of Western nations. He looks up in terror as the sound of marching feet is heard. The future of the West demands the committing of great forces into the hands of great men. The erection of a tradition of politics is a hope. From the chaos of 1950, there is no hope. Only great men can bridge the gap. All right, next chapter, race, people, nation, state. The 19th century concepts of race, people, nation, and state are exclusively of rationalistic romantic provenance. They are the result of imposing a thought method adapted to material problems onto living things, and thus they are materialistic. Materialistic means shallow as applied to living things, for with all life, spirit is primary and the material is the mere vehicle of spiritual expression. Since these 19th century concepts were rationalistic, they were based basically unfactual, for life is irrational, unamenable to inorganic logic and systematization. systematization. The age upon which we are entering, and of which this is a formulation, is an age of politics, and hence an age of facts. The broader subject is the adaptation, health, and pathology of high cultures. Their relationship to every type of human grouping is a prerequisite to examining the last problems of cultural vitalism. The nature of these groupings will be therefore looked at without preconceptions, 
with a view to reaching their deepest meanings, origin, life, and interconnections. Material inanimate objects retain their identity through the years, and thus the type of thinking suited to dealing with material things assumed that the political and other human groupings in existence in 1800 represented something a priori, something of the very essence of permanent reality. Everything was regarded as a creation of one of these peoples. This applied to the arts of form, literature, state, techniques, culture generally. This view is not in accordance with historical facts. The first concept in order is race. The materialistic race thinking of the 19th century had particularly heavy consequences for Europe when it was coupled with one of the early 20th century movements of resurgence of authority. Any excrescence of theoretical equipment on a political movement is a luxury, and the Europe of 1933 to 2000 can afford none such. Europe has paid dearly for this romantic concern with old-fashioned racial theories, and they must be destroyed. Section 2. Race has two meanings which will be taken in order, and then their relative importance in an age of absolute politics will be shown. The first meaning is an objective one, the second subjective. The succession of human generations related by blood have the clear tendency to remain fixed in the landscape. Nomadic tribes wander within larger but equally definite bounds. Within this landscape, the forms of plant and animal life have local characteristics different from transplantations of the same strains and stocks in other landscapes. The anthropological studies of the 19th centuries uncovered a mathematically presentable fact which affords a good starting point to show the influence of the soil. It was discovered that for any given inhabited area of the world, there was an average cephalic index of the population. More important, it was learned through measurements on immigrants to America from every part of Europe, and then on their children born in America, that this cephalic index adheres to the soil and immediately makes itself manifest in the new generation. Thus, long-headed Jews from Sicily and short-headed ones from Germany produced offspring with the same average head measurement the specifically American one. Now, some of that data was flawed, as I recall. The Jews are forever harping on that. Bodily size and span of growth were two other characteristics in which all types, whatever in America, Indians, Negroes, white men, were found to have the same average, regardless of average size and growth span of the countries or stocks from which they came. Well, that could be more a matter of nutrition, assuming the data is correct. Lots of animals will grow as big as they have the food or means to, the space to. In the case of immigrant Irish children, coming from a country of a very long growth span, the response to the local influence was immediate. From these and other facts, both comparatively new and of ancient observation, it is apparent that the landscape exerts an influence on the human stocks within its bounds, as well as on the plant and animal life. The technic of this influence is beyond our ken. The source of it we do know. It is the cosmic unity of the totality of things, a unity which shows itself in the rhythmic and cyclic movement of his nature, of, of nature. Man does not stand out of this unity, but is submerged in it. His duality of human soul and beast of prey is also a unity. We separate him thus to understand him, but this cannot disturb his unity. Nor by separating in our thoughts the aspects of nature can we destroy his unity, or its unity. The moon stands in a relationship to many human phenomena, of which we can know only what, but never how. All movement whatever in nature is rhythmic. The movement of streams and waves, of winds and currents, of appearance and disappearance, of living individuals, of species, of life itself. Man partakes of these rhythms. His particular structure gives these rhythms their peculiarly human form. The side of his nature that expresses this connection is race. Race in a man is the plane of his being which stands in relationship to plant and animal life and beyond them to the great macrocosmic rhythms. It is, so to speak, the part of man that is generalized and absorbed, generalized into, absorbed into the all rather than his soul which defines his species and sets him off from all other forms of existence. Life manifests itself in the four forms, plant, animal, man, high culture. Distinct though each is, 
and he's forced into that absurdity by claiming that high culture is actually literally an organism. He's acting like he actually believes that. I do not believe that. Distinct though each is, yet it is related to all the others. The animals, subject as they are to the soil, retain thus in their being a plane of plant-like existence. Race is the expression of the plant-like and also of the animal-like in man. The high culture, by being fixed for its duration to a landscape, retains also a connection with the plant world, no matter how defiant and free-moving are its proud creations. Its high politics and great wars are an expression of the animal and human in its nature. Some of the totality of human characteristics are soil-determined, others are stock-determined. Pigmentation is one of the latter and survives transplantation to other areas. It is not possible to list all of the physical characteristics according to such a scheme, for the data has not been gathered. But even so, it would not matter to our purpose, for the most important element, the most important element, also in the objective meaning of race, is the spiritual. Some stocks are undoubtedly more highly endowed than others in certain spiritual directions. Spiritual qualities are as diverse as physical qualities. Not only average height of body varies, but also average height of soul. Not only skull shape and stature are soil determined, but so must be some spiritual properties. It is impossible to believe that a cosmic influence which puts its mark on human bodies passes over the essence, the soul. But so thoroughly mixed have all the stocks been, or so repeatedly skimmed by history, that we can never know original soul qualities of landscapes. Of the racial qualities of a given population on the spiritual side, we can never know which are soil-bound, and which have been produced by the amalgamation of stocks through the generations. To a practical century like this, and the next, Origins and explanations are less important than facts and possibilities. Therefore, our next concern must be with race as a practical reality, rather than with its metaphysics. To what race does a man belong? We know at first glance, but exactly what sign tells us this cannot be materially explained. It is accessible only to the feelings, the instincts, and does not yield itself to the scale and balance of physical science. We have seen that race is connected with landscape and with stock. Its outer manifestation is a certain typical expression, a play of features, a cast of countenance. There are no rigid physical indicia of this expression, but this does not affect its existence, but solely the method of understanding it. Within wide limits, a primitive population in the landscape has a similar look, but closer scrutiny will be able to find local refinements and these again will branch down into tribes, clans, families, and finally individuals. Race, in the objective sense, is the spirituo-biological community of a group. The spirituo-biological community of a group. Thus, races cannot be classified other than arbitrarily he says, like a leftist, but from a different point of view. The materialistic 19th century produced several classifications of this arbitrary kind. The only characteristics used were, of course, purely material ones. Thus, skull form was the basis of one, hair and speech type of another, nose shape and pigmentation of another. This was at best mere group anatomy, but did not approach race. And what would he say today with DNA tests? Human beings live in contact with one another, influence one another, and thus approach one another. This applies to individuals, where it has been noted through the ages in the fact that an old married couple come to resemble one another physically, and it applies to groups as well. What is called the assimilation of one group by another is not at all merely the result of commingling of germplasm, as materialism thought. It is mostly the result of spiritual influence of the assimilating group on the newcomers, which is natural and complete when there are no strong barriers between the groups. The lack of barriers leads to the disappearance of the racial boundary, and thereafter a new race is present, the amalgamation of the two previous ones. The stronger one is influenced usually, but slightly. 
but there are various possibilities here, and an examination of them belongs properly to a subsequent place, while well, I might say that the lower drags down the higher, rather than the stronger one being slightly influenced, or else the lower one is more often the stronger one. Section 3. We have seen that race, objectively used, describes a relationship between a population and a landscape, and is essentially an expression of cosmic beat. cosmic rhythms. Its prime visible manifestation is the look, but this invisible reality expresses itself in other ways. To the Chinese, for instance, smell is a hallmark of race. Certainly audible things, speech, song, laughter, also have racial significance. If you think about the noises that Vietnamese make, you can tell they're not the same as whites. Susceptibility to disease is another racially differentiated phenomenon. The Japanese, Americans, and Negroes have three different degrees of resistance to tu tuberculosis. American medical statistics show that Jews have more nervous disease, more diabetes, and less tuberculosis than Americans, and that in fact the incidence of any one disease shows a different figure for the Jews. Gesture, gait, dress are not without racial significance, but the face is the great visible sign of race. We do not know what it is that conveys race in the physiognomy and attempts to reach it by statistics and measurements must fail. This fact has caused liberals and other materialists to deny that race exists. This incredible doctrine came from America, which is veritably a large-scale racial laboratory. The doctrine really only amounts to a confession of total inability of rationalism and scientific method to understand race or subject it to the order of the type of the physical sciences. And this inability was known before by those who have clung to facts and resisted anti-factual theories. Suppose that a man were to familiarize himself thoroughly with the measurements, length of nose, brows, chin, width of a brow, jaws, mouth, etc., of every face he knew, until he could fairly well say from a new face what its measurements would be, if he were then given a set of measurements merely written down as such, does anyone think that even such a specially trained person could form an, any idea in his mind of the racial expression of the face from which the measurements were taken? Of course not. And the same is true of any other expression of race. Another important objective aspect of race finds an analogy in the fashions of female physiognomy which come and go in a late urban civilization. When a given female type is held up as an ideal, it is a fact that the kind of woman who is sensitive to this sort of thing very soon develops the facial expression of this type. In the domain of race, a similar phenomenon exists. Given a race with a certain distinct cosmic beat, its members develop automatically an instinct for racial beauty, which affects the choice of mates, and also works on each individual soul from within, so that this double impetus forms the racial type pointing toward a certain ideal. This instinct for racial beauty, needless to say, has no connections with the decadent erotic cults of the Hollywood type. Such ideals are purely individual intellectual and have no connection with race. Race being an expression of the cosmic is informed throughout with the urge to continuity and a racially ideal woman is always thought of quite unconsciously as the potential mother of strong sons. The racially ideal man is the master who will enrich the life of the woman who secures him as the father of her children. The degenerate eroticism of the Hollywood type is anti-racial. Its root idea is not life continuity, but pleasure, with the woman as the object of pleasure, and the man as the slave of this object. This striving of a race toward its own physical type is one of the great facts with which one cannot tamper by trying to substitute ideals of amalgamation with types totally alien, as liberalism and communism tried to do during the reign of rationalism. Race cannot be understood if it is inwardly associated with phenomena from other planes of life, such as nationality, politics, people, state, culture. While history in its advance may bring about for a few centuries a strong relationship between race and nation, that is not to say that a preceding racial type always forms a subsequent political unit. If that were so, none of the former nations of Europe would have been formed on the lines they were. 
For example, think of the racial differences between Calabrian and Lombard. What did they matter to the history of Garibaldi's time? This brings us to the most important phase of the objective meaning of race in this age. History narrows or widens the limits of race determinacy. The way this is done is through the spiritual element in race. Thus a group with a spiritual and historical community tends to acquire also a racial aspect. The community of which its higher nature partakes is transmitted downward to the lower cosmic part of the human nature. Thus in Western history the early nobility tended to constitute itself as a race complement, as a race to complement its unity on the spiritual side. The extent to which this proceeded is still apparent wherever historical continuity of the early nobility has been maintained to the present day. An important example of this is the creation of the Jewish race that we now know in the millennium of ghetto existence in Europe. Leaving to one side for the moment the different world outlook and culture of the Jew, this sharing by a group, whatever the basis of its original formation as such, of a common fate for centuries will hammer it into a race as well as a spiritual historical unit. Race influences history by supplying its material, its treasures of blood, honor, and strong instincts. History in turn influences race by giving to units of high history a racial stamp as well as their spiritual one. Race is a lower plane of existence in the sense that it is closer to the cosmic, more in touch with the primitive yearnings and urges of life in general. Race influences history by supplying its material, its treasures of blood, honor, and strong instincts. History in turn influences race by giving to units of high history a racial stamp as well as their spiritual one. Race is a lower plane of existence in the sense that it is closer to the cosmic, more in touch with the primitive yearnings and urges of life in general. History is the higher plane of existence where the specifically human, and above that the high cultural, represent the differentiation of forms of life. The method of racialization of an historical unit, as the Western nobilities were racialized, is through the inevitable cosmic rising in such a group of an ideal physical type and the instinct for racial beauty, which work together through the germplasm and inwardly in each soul to give this group its own look. That individualizes it in the stream of history. Once this community of fate departs through the vicissitudes of history, this race vanishes also, never to appear again. Section 4. From this point, the fundamental misunderstanding of the 19th century, materialistic interpretation of race, appears, appears clear and distinct. I'm just going to list a bunch of things that race is not. Race is not group anatomy. Race is not independent of the soil. Race is not independent of spirit and history, capital S and H. Races are not classifiable except on an arbitrary basis. Race is not a rigid, permanent, collective characterization of human beings, which remains always the same throughout history. The 20th century outlook, based on facts, and not on the preconceptions of physics and mechanics, sees race as fluid gliding with history over the fixed skeletal form determined by the soil. Just as history comes and goes, so does race with it, bound in a symbiosis of happening. The peasants now tilling the soil near Persepolis are of the same race as those who planted or roamed there a thousand years before Darius, regardless of what they were called then, or what they are called now, and in the time between, a high culture fulfilled itself in this area, creating races now gone forever. This last error, the confusing of names with unities of history or race, was one of the most destructive made by 19th century materialism. Names belong to the surface of history, not to its rhythmic, cosmic side. If the present-day inhabitants of Greece have the same collective name that the population of the same area had in Aristotle's time, is anyone deceived into thinking that there is historical continuity or racial continuity? Names, like languages, have their own destinies, and these destinies are independent of others. 
Thus, from the common language, it should not be inferred that the inhabitants of Haiti and those of Quebec have a common origin, but this result would occur of necessity if 19th century methods were applied to the present, which we know, as well as to interpretation of the past, from leftover names and language, languages. The inhabitants of Yucatan today are racially the same as in 100 A.D., even though they now speak Spanish, and then spoke a now-vanished tongue, even though they have a different name now from then. In between occurred the rise, fulfillment, and wiping out of a high culture, but after its passing, race became once more the primeval, simple relationship between stock and landscape. There was no high history to influence it, or for it to influence. In the time of the Egyptian culture, a people called the Libyans gave their name to an area. Does that mean that whoever inhabits this are from then on related to them? The Prussians in the year 1000 AD were an extra-European people. In 1700, the name Prussia described a nation in the Western style. Western conquerors merely acquired the name of the tribes they displaced. That which went under the various names of Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Jutes, Varangians, Saxons, Vandals, Norsemen, Danes, came from the same racial material, but the names did not show it. Sometimes a group gives its name to an area so that after it is displaced, the old name passes to the conquering group. This was the case of Prussia and Britain. Sometimes a group takes its name from an area, like the Americans. And as far as the race history symbiosis is concerned, names are accidental. They do not indicate any sort of inward continuity by themselves. The same is true of language. Once the idea is grasped that what we call history really means high history, that this is the history of high cultures, and that these high cultures are organic unities expressing their inner possibilities in the profuse forms of thought and happening which lie before us, a deep understanding follows of the way in which history uses whatever human material lies to hand for its fulfillment. It puts its impress on this material by creating historical units out of groups hitherto often very inverse biolog or diverse biologically. The historical unity and harmony with cosmic rhythms governing all life from plant to culture acquires its own racial unity, a new racial unity, removed by its spiritual historical content from the former, primitive symbol relationship between stock and soil. But with the departure of high history, the fulfillment of the culture, the spiritual historical content recedes forever, and the primitive harmony resumes its dominant position. The previous biological history of the groups taken by a high culture play no role in this process. Previous names of indigenous tribes, previous wanderings, linguistic equipment, none have any meaning for high history once it sets upon its course. It starts, so to speak, from a clean slate, but it remains this way also in its ability to take in whatever elements enter into its spirit. New elements, however, can bring nothing to the culture. It is a higher individuality, and thus it has its own unity, which cannot even be influenced, other than superficially, by an organism of equivalent rank, and a fortiori cannot be changed in the slightest in its inner nature by any human group. Thus any group coming within the area of a culture is either within the spirit of the culture or without it. There is no third alternative. Organic alternatives are always only two. Life or death, sickness or health, forward development or distortion. When the organism is put off its true path by external influences, crisis is bound to follow, crisis which will affect the entire life of the culture and will often involve the destiny of millions in confusion and catastrophe. But this is an anticipation. The objective meaning of race has other aspects important to a 20th century outlook. It has been seen that races, meaning here primitive groupings, simple relationships between soil and human stock, have different gifts for historical purposes. We have seen that race influences history as well as the converse. We come to the hierarchy of races. Section 5. The materialists could, of course, not succeed with all their attempts to make an anatomical classification of races. But races can be classified according to functional abilities, 
starting from any given function whatever. Thus, a hierarchy of races can be based on physical strength, and there is little doubt that the Negro would stand at the top of such a hierarchy. That's factually wrong, because whenever they have the strongman competition, they're won by Nordics. There would, however, be no point in such a hierarchy, because physical strength is not the essence of human nature in general, and even less of culture man in particular. The fundamental impulse of human nature, above the instincts toward self-preservation and sex, which man shares with other life forms, is the will to power. Very seldom is there any struggle for existence among men. Such struggles as do occur are nearly always for control, for power. These take place within couples and families, clans, tribes, and among peoples, nations, states. Therefore, the basing of a hierarchy of races on strength of will to power has a relation to historical realities. Such a hierarchy can, of course, can have, of course, no eternal validity. Thus the school of Gobineau, Chamberlain, Osbaum, and Grant was on the same tangent as the materialists, who announced that there is no such thing as race because they could not discover it with their methods. The mistake of the former was to assume the permanence, backwards and forwards, of races existing in their time. They were treating races as building blocks, original material, and ignoring the connections of race and history, race and spirit, race and destiny. But at least they recognized the existing racial realities of their time, their sole mistake consisting in regarding these realities as rigid, existing rather than becoming. There was also in their approach a remnant of genealogical thinking, but this sort of thinking is intellectual and not historical, for history uses the human material at hand without questioning its antecedents, and in the process of using it, this human material is placed in relation to the vast mystical force of destiny. This remainder of genealogical thinking tended to create divisions in thought between culture peoples, corresponding to no divisions in actuality. The further materialistic tendency developed to extend the principles of heredity which Mendel had worked out for certain plants to the subject of human race. Such a tendency was doomed to be fruitless, and after almost a century of barren results, it must be abandoned in favor of the 20th century outlook, which approaches history and its materials in the historical spirit, and not in the scientific spirit of mechanics or geology. Nevertheless, the school of Gobineau at least started from a fact, and this brings it much closer to reality than the learned fools who looked up from their rulers and charts to announce the demise of race. This fact was the hierarchy of races for cultural purposes, capital C. In their day, the word culture was used to designate literature and the fine arts as distinct from the ugly, brutal things like economics, technics, war, and politics. Hence, the center of gravity of these theories was on the side of intellect rather than on the side of the soul. With the coming of the 20th century outlook and the clearing of the, from the air of all materialistic romantic theories, the unity of culture was perceived through all its various manifestations of arts, philosophy, religion, science, technics, politics, state forms, race forms, war. Therefore, the hierarchy of races in this century is one based on degree of will to power. This classification of races is also arbitrary from the intellectual standpoint, just as much as one based on physical strength. It is, however, the only one suitable for us in this age. Nor is it rigid, for the vicissitudes of history are more important in this realm than hereditary transmitted qualities. There is today no Hindu race, although there once was. This name is a product of accomplished history and corresponds to no racial group. Nor is there a Basque race, a Breton race, a Hessian race, an Andalusian race, a Bavarian race, Austrian race. Similarly, races existing today in our Western civilization will also disappear with the advance of history over them. The source of a hierarchy of races is history, the forces of happening. Thus, when we see a European population with its own racial stamp, the English, 
hold down a population of hundreds of millions of Asiatics for two centuries with only a handful of its own troops, as the English did India, we call that race one with a high degree of will to power. During the 19th century, amid 300 million Asiatics, England had a tiny garrison of 65,000 white troops. The mere numbers would mislead if we did not know that England was a nation in the service of a high culture, and India a mere landscape with primitive millions teeming in it, a landscape that had been also at one time the area of a high culture such as our own, but had long since returned to its pre-cultural primitivity within the ruins and monuments of the past. Knowing this, we know thereby that the source of this stern will to power is at least partially in the force of the destiny of the culture of which England was an expression. When we see a race like the Spanish send forth two bands like those of Cortez and Pizarro and read of their accomplishments, we know we are in the presence of a race with high willpower. With a hundred odd men, Pizarro set out to overcome an empire of millions. The project of Cortez was of a like boldness, and both achieved military success. It is not a slave race that can do such things. Aztec and Inca were no raceless populations, but were themselves the vehicle of another high culture, a fact which makes these exploits almost incredible. Or is theory wrong? The French race in the time of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars was in the service of a cultural idea, the mission of changing the whole direction from culture to civilization, of opening the age of rationalism. The enormous force which this living idea lent to the armies of France is shown by the 20-year succession of military victories over all the armies that repeated coalitions of all Europe could throw against them. Under Napoleon's personal command, they achieved victory in more than 145 out of 150 engagements. A race equal to such a test was one of high willpower. In each of these cases, the race was one created by history. In such a unit, the word race contains the two elements, the stock landscape relationship and the spiritual community of history and cultural idea. They are, so to speak, stratified. Beneath is the strong primitive beat of the cosmic rhythm and a particular stock, above is the molding, creating, driving destiny of a high culture. When Charles of Anjou beheaded Conradin, the last Hohenstaufen emperor, in 1267, Germany disappeared from Western history as a unit with political significance for 500 years, reappearing in the 18th century in the double form of Austria and Prussia. During these centuries, the high history of Europe was made by other powers, mostly with their own blood. This meant that, in comparison with the vast expenditure of blood over the generations of the others, Germany was spared. To understand the significance of this fact, we must go back to the purely biological origin of races of Europe. In section 6, the primeval population streams which came out of the north of the Eurasiatic landmass from 2000 BC right down to 1000 AD and after, were probably of related stock. Barbarians called Kassites conquered the remains of the Babylonian culture about 1700 BC. The next century, northern barbarians called Hyksos by the Egyptians threw themselves at the ruins of the Egyptian civilization and subjected it to their rule. In India, the Aryans, also a northern barbarian horde, conquered the Indian culture. The populations which appeared in Europe over the millennium and a half, ending 1000 AD under the various names, Franks, Angles, Goths, Saxons, Celts, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Lombards, Belge, Norsemen, Northmen, Vikings, Danes, Varangians, Germani, Alemanni, Teutones, and other names are all of similar stock. It is very probable that the conquerors of the older civilizations eastward were of similar stock with the western barbarians who threatened Rome for centuries and finally sacked it. The great sign of this stock was blondness. Wherever today blonde traits are found, elements of this northern stock have at some time in the past found their way. These northern barbarians conquered the indigenous populations of all Europe, constituting themselves an upper stratum, supplying the leadership, fighting men, and laws wherever they went. Thus they represented the ruling stratum in the territories now known as Spain, Italy, France, Germany, England. Their numerical proportion was greater in some places than in others. 
and with the arising of the Western culture around 1000 AD, it was on this strong-willed primitive stratum that the idea took hold. From having been the conqueror of fulfilled civilizations, this stock was now itself selected to fulfill the destiny of a high culture. That which distinguished this strong that which distinguished this primitive biological population stream is its strong will. It is also this strong will, and not only the inner idea of the culture itself, that contributes to Western history the unique forcefulness of its manifestations in all directions of thought and action. Think of the Vikings in the gray dawn of our history reaching America from Europe in their tiny ships. This is the sort of human material which contributed its blood to the Western races, peoples, and nations. It is to this treasure of being that the West owes its prowess on the battlefield, and this fact is known all over the world, whether it is theoretically denied or not. Ask any general in any army whether he would rather have under his command a division of soldiers recruited from Pomerania or a division of Negroes. Unhappily for the West, the Russian populations contain also a strong strain of this northern barbarian stock. It is not in the service of a high culture, but stands to us as did the Gauls to the Republican and Imperial Rome. Race is material for events, and it is available to the will to annihilate as freely as it is to the will to create. The northern barbarian stock in Russia is still barbarian, and its negative mission has given it its own racial stamp. History has created a Russian race, which is steadily widening its racial boundaries by taking up into it, and impressing with its historical mission of destruction, the population streams of its vast territory. In the hierarchy of races based on will to power, the new Russian race stands high. The race needs no moralistic propaganda to fan its militancy. Its barbarian instincts are there, and can be relied upon by its leaders. Because of the fluid nature of race, even the hierarchy of races based on will to power cannot succeed in ordering all races now existing. For instance, would the Sikhs stand above the Sengalese, or below the American Negroes, or above or below the Aymara Indians? But the whole purpose of understanding the varying degrees of will to power in different races is a practical one, and applies in the first instance to our own Western civilization. Can this knowledge be used? The answer is that not only it can, but it must be, if the West is to live out its lifespan and not to pass into slavery to Asiatic annihilation hordes under the leadership of Russia, Japan, or some other militant race. Before this information can be applied with full insight and with no danger of old-fashioned misunderstanding, the subjective meaning of race must be examined, and beyond it, the ideas connoted by the terms people, nation, and state. Next chapter is subjective meaning of race. Race, as has been shown, is not a unit of existence, but is an aspect of existence. Specifically, it is the aspect of existence in which the relation of the human being to the great cosmic rhythms is revealed. It is thus the non-individual aspect of life, whether it be the life of a plant, animal, or human being. The plant exhibits, at least not to us, no consciousness, i.e. no tension with its environment. The plant has thus only race, so to speak, for it is totally submerged in the cosmic flow. The animal exhibits tension, consciousness, individuality. Man has, in addition, self-consciousness and the ability and necessity of living a higher life in the realm of symbols. All men have this. But the difference in degree between primitive man and culture man in this respect is so vast that it seems almost a difference in kind. It is the racial beat which informs primitive impulses, which informs action generally. Opposed to it is the illuminated part of the mind, the rootless reason, the intellect. The stronger these things are in relation to the racial plane, the more the existence bears an intellectual instead of a racial stamp. Each individual, as well as each higher organic unit, has these two aspects. Race impels towards self-preservation, continuance of the cycle of generations, increase of power. Intellect decides the meaning of the life, and the aim, and this may, for various reasons, deny one or all of these fundamental urges. 
The celibacy of the priest and the sterility of the libertine both come from the intellect, but one of them is an expression of high culture, and the other is the denial of culture, an expression of total degeneracy. Intellect may thus be in the service of culture, or opposed to it. Race is, in the first instance, in its subjective sense, what a man feels. This influences whether immediately or eventually what he does. A man of race is not born to slavery. If his intellect counsel him to a temporary submission, rather than an heroic death, in the hope of future changes, it is a mere postponement of his breaking out. The man without race will submit permanently to any humiliation, any insult, any dishonor, so long as he is permitted to live. The continuance of breathing and digestion are life to the man without race. To the man of race, life itself represents no value, but only life under the right conditions, affirmative life, rich, expressive, and growing. Heroism can be motivated from either side of the soul. The martyr dies for the truth, which he knows. The fighting man who dies with weapons in his hands rather than submit to his enemies dies for the honor that he feels. But the man who dies for something higher shows that he has race, regardless of his intellectualized motives. For race is the faculty of being true to oneself. It is the placing of a beyond value on one's own individual soul. In this subjective sense, race is not the way one talks, looks, gestures, walks. It is not a matter of stock, color, anatomy, skeletal structure, or anything else objective. Men of race are scattered through all populations everywhere, through all races, peoples, nations. In each unit they make up the warriors, the leader of action, the creators in the sphere of politics and war. Thus, in the subjective sense, there is also a hierarchy of race. Above the men of race, below those without race. The first are swept up into action and events by the great cosmic rhythm of motion. The second are passed over by history. The first are the materials of high history. The second have outlasted every culture, and when the stillness resumes its sway over the landscape, after the whirlwind of events, <laughs> these are great mass. These are the great mass. The Chinese mothers counsel their children with the ancient admonition, Make thy heart small. This is the wisdom of the man without race, and of the race without will. The men of race are skimmed off every population that is caught up into the course of motion of a high culture, and this process continues through the generations of history on the heights. What is left is the falahin. Those are like the sheep herders, the, the basic sorts of uh, Muslim peasants. Race in the subjective sense is thus seen to, to be a matter of instinct. The man with strong instincts has race. The man with weak or bad instincts has it not. Strength of intellect has nothing to do with the existence of race. It may merely in some cases, such as that of the man who takes a vow of celibacy, influence the expression, expression of a part of race. Strong in, intellect and strong instincts can coexist. Think of the Gothic bishops who led their flocks to war. They are merely opposed directions of thought and action, but it is the instincts that furnish the driving force for great intellectual accomplishments also. The center of gravity ascendant of ascendant life is on the side of instinct, will, race, blood. Life, which places rationalistic ideals of individualism, happiness, freedom, before the perpetuation and increase of power, is decadent. Decadent means moving toward extinction, extinction of higher life in particular, and finally even of the life of the race. The intellectual of the great city is the type of the man without race. In every civilization he has been the inner ally of the outer barbarian. This quality of having race has, obviously, no connection with which race one feels community. Race in the objective sense is a creation of history. One's destiny must express itself within a certain framework, the framework of fate. Thus a man born of race, thus a man of race born in Kyrgyzia, belongs by fate to the barbarian world of Asia with its historical mission of destruction of the Western civilization. Rare exceptions are, of course, possible. Life submits to no generalization entirely. Some Poles, Ukrainians, or even Russians might be impelled by their souls to share the spirit of the West. 
If so, they belong to the Western race, and every healthy ascendant race accepts recruits who come in on its terms and who have the proper feeling. In the same way, there are numerous intellectuals in the West who feel community with the outer idea of Asiatic nihilism. How numerous they are is indicated by the journalism, novels, and plays that live from them. But the converse would not be true of men without race. They are not even acceptable to the enemy. They have nothing to contribute to an organic group. They are the human grains of sand, atoms of intellect, without cohesion upwards or downwards. Every race, no matter how transitory, may be contemplated from the viewpoint of history, expresses a certain idea, a certain plane of existence, by its life, and its idea is bound to be attractive to some individuals outside it. Thus, in Western life, we are not unfamiliar with a man who, after associating with Jews, reading their literature, and adopting their viewpoint, actually becomes a Jew in the fullest sense of the word. It is not necessary that he have Jewish blood. The converse is also known. Many Jews have adopted Western feelings and rhythms, and have thereby acquired Western race. Don't agree with that. This process, contemptuously called assimilation by the Jewish leaders, threatened during the 19th century the very existence of the Jewish race by ultimate absorption of its total racial body into the Western races. To halt it, the leaders of the Jews evolved the program of Zionism, which was solely an expedient for maintaining the unity of the Jewish race and maintaining its continued existence as such. For this reason, they also recognized the value of anti-Semitism of the social type. It was serving the same purpose of preserving the racial unity of the Jews. Now, section 2. The dying out of racial instincts means the same thing to an individual as it does to a race, people, nation, state, culture. Unfruitfulness. Lack of will to power. Lack of ability to believe in or follow great aims. Lack of inner discipline. Desire for a life of ease and pleasure. The symptoms of this racial decadence in various parts of the Western civilization are manifold. There is first the ghastly distortion of the sexual life arising from the complete dissociation of sexual love from reproduction. The great symbol of this in the Western civilization is everything suggested by the name Hollywood. The message of Hollywood is the total significance of sexual love as an end in itself, the erotic without consequences. The sexual love of two grains of sand, two rootless individuals, not the primeval sexual love looking to the continuity of life, the family of many children. One child is permitted, as being a more complicated toy than a dog perhaps, even two, one boy and one girl, but the family of many children is a subject for humor to this decadent outlook. The instinct of decadence takes many forms in this realm, dissolution of marriage by divorce laws, attempts to discard through repeal or non-enforcement the laws against abortion, preaching in the form of novel, drama, journalism, the identification of happiness with sexual love, holding it up as the great value, before which all honor, duty, patriotism, consecration of life to a higher aim must give way. An erotomania is abroad through our civilization, not indeed like the sexual obsession of the 13th century, which was at least racially affirmative, in that it increased the Western peoples, but always a purely rootless, erotic without consequences, the spiritual, this spiritual disease is the suicide of the race. The weakening of the will, Nietzsche called it paralysis of the will, another symptom of dying out of racial instincts, leads to a total deterioration of public life in the afflicted races. Government leaders dare not offer a stern program to their masses of human grains of sand. They abdicate but remain in office as private men. Government ceases. The only functions that continue are the ones that have always gone on. No new aim, no sacrifices, keep the old going, no creation, no effort. That would be too hard. Keep the pleasures going, the panamet circenses, circenses. Never mind the necessities of life, we are willing to renounce them as long as we have the pleasures. This weakening of the will leads to voluntary abandonment of empires, conquered with the blood of millions over ten generations. It leads to abysmal hatred of whoever and whatever represents sternness, creation, the future. One of its products is pacifism, and the only way a racially dissolving population can be driven to war is through conscription, coupled with pacifist propaganda. This is the last war. Actually, it is a war against war. Only an intellectual could be taken in by such stark unreality. 
The weak will of society manifests itself in the Bolshevism of the upper classes, the sympathy with the enemies of society. Anyone with unimpaired will, however, is really felt to be the enemy. Even cogent reasoning is hated. Ideals are so much less demanding. Mediocrity rises over the horizon of a dying race as its last great ideal. Total mediocrity, renunciation of all greatness and distinction of any kind, whatever. Also, mediocrity of the racial bloodstream. Anyone can come in now, not only on our terms, for there are no more terms. There are no racial differences. Everything is one dull, eventless, mediocre. The weakening... <coughs> The weakening of the will is not hard put to find an ideology which rationalizes it as progress. Everything desirable, the aim of all previous history. The democracy-liberalism complex lies to hand, and it acquires in such times the meaning of death, of race, nation, and culture. There are no human differences. Everyone is equal. Men are women. Women are men. The individual is everything. Life is a long holiday whose main problem is devising new and more stupid pleasures. There is no God, no state. Off with the head of anyone who says there is a mission, who wishes to resurrect authority. These symptoms or similar ones will be found present at the demise of every upper stratum whose will is weakened. Thus Tocqueville has described for us how the French upper stratum of 1789 had no suspicion whatever of the impending revolution. How nobility waxed enthusiastic over the natural goodness of humanity, quote, the virtuous people, quote, the innocence of man, quote, while the terror of 1793 lay before their very feet. Spectacle terrible ridicule. Did not the Petrine nobility of Russia up until 1917 go through the same performance? The Tsar resisted pleas to leave while there was time with, quote, my people will not hurt me. Their picture of the Russian peasant, peasant was that of a happy, simple music, M-U-Z-H-I-K, basically good. Similarly, the weakening of the Western will in certain countries was shown by the deluge of pro-Russian propaganda spread, sometimes with official encouragement, in those countries from 1920 to 1960. New chapter, Horizontal Race versus Vertical Race. We attain now to the grand formula of the 20th century outlook on race. Race is a horizontal differentiation of men. The materialism of the 19th century, confusing a race with anatomy, regarded race as a vertical differentiation of men. It was abstract, away from reality, and started from the will to systematize rather than from quiet contemplation of the living facts. Such contemplation was made difficult for them by the existence of political nationalism, which tried to build walls of all kinds between the Western races and peoples. But had they been able to pierce through to a view of the facts, these materialists would have seen that the races of Europe were the creations of history and not a mere continuation of the aboriginal material that was present in 900 AD, before the beginning of high history in this area. Viewing the process of creation of races, they would have seen the far greater significance of race in the subjective sense than in the objective sense, for it is always men of race that create the deeds of history, and the units they are leading are of secondary importance. The attempt to create a vertical system of races was Apollonian. It was an effort of the intellect. Actually, race has the same primary meaning of presence, has the primary meaning of presence of strong cosmic rhythm, a Dionysian meaning. The 20th century viewpoint in this matter starting from facts, and the observed fact is that all strong minorities, both within and without a high culture, have welcomed into their company the outsider who is attracted to it and wished to join it, regardless of his racial provenance, objectively speaking. The racial snobbery of the 19th century was intellectual, and its adoption in a too narrow sphere by the resurgence of authority in Europe between the first two world wars was a grotesquerie. He's sort of echoing Evola here to some extent that race is more spiritual than biological. It's almost a matter of choice and strength of will than purely an arrangement of atoms. What matters to a unit engaged upon a mission is the strength of will which other groups can bring to it. To interpret the historical mission as one of safeguarding the purity of the race in a purely biological sense is sheer materialism. Race in both its meanings is a material of history, not the reverse. 
Race supplies the fruitfulness, sureness, and will to power to the mission. The mission can never be to make the race pure in a biological sense, however satisfying such a result would be aesthetically. And with this last word is touched upon the other factor in the tragic connection of this old-fashioned outlook on race with the strong vital movement of resurgence of authority. We have seen that all the 19th century concepts in this sphere, race, people, nation, state, culture, were of rationalistic, romantic derivation. Romantic. Half of this misalliance of the future and the past is traceable to romantic aesthetic notions. Aesthetics is, however, a domain of its own. It does not have sufficient vitality to supply the motivation of a political struggle. Uh, that could be taken as a shot against Beauty Will Save Us, which one of the Russian novelists said, and David Duke has uh, repeated dull, uh, dully, I mean duly. Uh, but I don't <laughs> believe that myself, and he seems to be talking about that. Its presence there can only be superfluous. The stark historical value in this matter is simply this. It only matters that the cultural mission to be accomplished, even though in the process everything else is wiped out. And after that, did Darius ever think that lions would one day be roaming his terrace of Persepolis? And if he had, what could he have done about it? History, with its great rhythms, the widest and deepest we know, is also submerged in the cosmos, and for culture man to think that he can impose his will on the millennially remote future, thousands of years, is only a tribute to his pride of intellect, but no compliment to his wisdom. We are thinking here in centuries, not in months or years. One must oppose the attitude of après moi le deluge, after me the flood, which prevails at this moment. It is not a shirking or evading of duty to say that only the historical mission matters, capital M, but the highest possible affirmation of duty, capital D. To race, there is no duty. Race, in the vertical sense, is an abstraction, corresponding to nothing existing. If taken seriously, it leads the victim off the path of history and into an aesthetic cul-de-sac. To the 20th century outlook, a man does not belong to a race. He either has race or does not. If the former, he has value to history. If the latter, he is valueless, a lackey. The attempt to interpret history in terms of race must be abandoned. The 20th century sees it quite otherwise. That attempt was a fad, historically speaking. It had a vogue of a century. It is now quite dead. Its last formulation, and its most radical, attempted even to intervene in the sphere of action. That was the last such attempt, an empire of a thousand years' duration. Yes, that has been actualized in India, China, Egypt. But the nations that laid the foundations of these empires could not know whether the barbarians would come soon or never. Montezuma's empire would also have lasted a thousand years, but the Spaniards appear, appeared. There is no guarantee of duration, racial or other. Actually, it is race that must be interpreted in terms of history, for that is the factual developmental sequence. This viewpoint is not a fad, an arbitrary abstract picture, but run reflecting the facts of history. And I think we'll leave it there for right now. We've got about halfway through, or we're near, nearly halfway through Imperium. Somewhat different view of race than what most of us think about today. A man either has race or doesn't have race, not so much that he belongs to a race, but the mere fact of, of being a member of what he calls socially arbitrary category, uh, being all important as we tend to think. Anyway, thanks for listening to me today, and I'll be back with you again real soon.